Now, now, Steve, you came from the hospital side, obviously, before you you uh, went went on, you know went to the uh, independent practice side. What what are some of the differences that groups need to be thinking about? You know, now that you've been on a on the big side, where we oftentimes don't view hospitals as as mostly friendly, to now working directly with the physicians. What are you know What are some of the things that that you could recommend that we as physicians need to do better? Well, I think it's important in the first year I've been in the practice there in Tulsa, what I took the approach is just going through all the different expense items in the practice. And in many t cases, bidding those items out, whether that's uh, insurance, uh, whether that's products, uh, putting the practice in multiple group purchasing organizations. Um, I recommended to the doctors that we have a full-time person focused on supplies with a 20-man group like that, who that's all they do every day is make sure we get the best price. And many times that's shopping it amongst four different group purchasing organizations to get the best deal for the physicians out there. But what I found in this practice is putting things out to bid, asking the difficult questions, asking people, is there a better price? I think we've been able to bring things to the table. I think you have to do that continuously these days, and that's what I learned in the hospital world is challenge it continuously, look at it, put everything transparent on the table, and then come up with what the best solution is for the practice. Also on the revenue generation side, I think it's very important that the doctors continue to kind of audit their coding techniques for CPT coding. And we brought in an external auditor as well as every week we audit one doctor and share those results at the operations committee and the board level and that doctor gets feedback on their coding. So I think it's a continuous process, but you've got to be looking at the revenue side and the expense side. So if a, if a physician, because obviously there's, whether it be device, whether it be lab, whether it be therapeutics, if a physician comes to the practice and says, hey, I want to use, I want to start using this, or I think uh, that we ought to offer this lab test that's going to be expensive, but I think it's great care, and I think we need to adopt this. How do you, operationally, how does that go through your business model? What we do is, for so some of the exotic lab tests, we have uh, the physician maybe bringing it to the table. We get one of our urologists, and we have a relationship with a pathology group, and so we bring them together to collaborate on the efficacy and, and the appropriateness, and what is the clinical research, and what are the studies. Uh, the management team looks at the cost and reimbursement models and the risk to the practice. We bring all that into a discussion at the operations committee and then we pick a direction. And like that, it's always usually a physician champion on those particular elements. And usually there's one physician in the group that has that subspecialty training and the partners all look to as kind of the expert in that particular area. Uh, and, and our practice, Dr. Forrest, has obviously got an oncology background and so any of the tests around that they look to him to give his opinion and then we go for consensus and then it becomes the gold standard and we will not allow those other vendors then to come into practice. We're about to the level to even stop allowing some of those other vendors to come in and come to lunches and get access to our doctors. Once we've made a clinical decision, we're going to block them from coming in. Dan, what, I mean, do you guys do it the same way? Do you have a, a core group that looks at obviously the clinical efficacy and then also, obviously, like uh, what I think is also important is the is the financials and the and the reimbursement side. Yes, we do. We have, like I said, an operations committee that uh, you can present at if you if there's a lab or a new product that you want to see incorporated into our office structure, um, and it's got to have. There's going to be a physician champion. We're going to look at the clinical efficacy, side effects, and then cost. Uh, in San Antonio, we have our own lab, not only lab, but also our own path lab. So it allows us to look at the costs a little bit differently and see how we can incorporate some of these things. We've also instituted in some of our, I hate to say it, some of the more expensive uh, drugs, whether it be Testapel, Exgeva, Provenge, we have one person in our business office who's directly related to making sure that the, the reimbursement issues are all covered before we institute any of those products in our office. I think that's a good point too. You know, we talk about physician champions for new therapeutics, but in my office at least, I, we have what I call my billing champion. I mean, right. she's my go-to person. She, you know, I just tell her I want, and then she'll tell me whether I can. <laughs> right. We have one person in our practice that only one person can authorize Provenge. Right. for our practice. 
And I brought in the sales rep and I said, do not make a mistake. This is the only person you need to follow it every time because it's going to be your responsibility if there's an error in this equation and you jump ahead before we give it. So that one business office person calls the physician's primary nurse and then we place the order. All right. And I think in general, all of these plans that we do, I mean, you guys comment too, but we're all doing okay with those business plans. We set it up correctly trying to make sure that you know you didn't create a financial error and they all have been positive cost centers and working out all right. We've taken to a different level obviously with ProGrange and the cost. We've, I've got a separate Excel spreadsheet with every patient listed, every primary reimbursement, every secondary reimbursement, how much came from the patient, how much we got from the foundations, and then I link it to the rebate process so that we've got one all-inclusive document that I can present at the board meetings to give the doctors exactly what's going on with that particular drug. Yeah, I think it's very nice that you break that out from other things. Uh, it makes it a lot more uh, simpler for the docs to understand what's going on and where if it is a profit center, is it a costing you things like that? We did it as a cost center and then I come back to my group and show that it's not a cost center, it's really a profit center. It's All been right. working okay. See, I think this is this is a such a fine balancing act because again I think first and foremost we have to again hopefully our culture amongst many of our groups is that we need to continue to to practice great medicine and take care of our patients we need to do what's what's right we need to manage the complications whether it be the institution of LHRH therapy we need to manage the bone loss but then once once we get into this advancing state where we have these castration resistant prostate cancer patients. It's, it's my feel that, again, looking, looking at that disease continuum slide, we've always been pretty good up to hormonal therapy. And then after that, we kind of fell away. Now we have the opportunity with all these therapeutics to be able to, again, treat these patients. And like Dan, I think you said it nicely, is that they've been coming to our practice for five, 10, 15 years. We've ushered them through their elevation, their PSA, their biopsy, their management. Um, and hopefully in, in select cases, their active surveillance. Uh, we know that they will fail, we, that, that a certain percentage will fail. We know that we have therapies. It, in my belief, there isn't this educational hurdle that we have to get to the physicians in order to educate them in terms of making sure that these patients do get optimal care that will benefit then because of the expense of this then you know we obviously uh, have to make sure because we are we are small business owners that we have to make sure that this uh, makes sense in order for our practices to continue to survive uh, on on the financial side